Welcome to Bellingham Voices. I'm Marie Marchand. On today's show, my guest is local peace activist Ellen Murphy. Ellen is a retired chemical dependency counselor who started the Self-Help Clearinghouse in San Diego, and she worked at the Recovery Center at St. Joseph's Hospital. In 1986, she walked across America in the Great Peace March. She's been arrested numerous times for civil disobedience, including with her affinity group Desert Waves at the Nevada Desert Test Site. Welcome to the show, Ellen. Thank you, Marie. I'm happy to be here. It's great to have you. I'm really excited about our conversation. I'm proud to be here because of all you've contributed to the community. Oh, thank you so much. (laughs) So, you're a passionate advocate for peace and justice, and I'm hoping we can start out by having you share when that passion emerged for you in your life. I've given that some thought, and in fact, I remember the last, uh, I was asked, that before, I went right to the nuns in my mind. And I skipped over the tension and arguing in the house I grew up in. <laughs> so mm. I, I need to go back to that because really that is where it began. There was, I never heard anything spoken against people, anyone, judgments, uh, certainly not racist statements or anything like that in my home. They were good people, but they argued and there was a lot of tension. And really as a young child, you know, saying my prayers at night and doing my thinking, I wanted to work for peace. I wanted to help people to release that tension if necessary or to find a way. And really, I, I, it almost feels like I was born with it because I've I've cared about that for so long, and it's probably why I became a teacher and a counselor. <clears throat> Just got over that Bellingham cold, excuse me. So I didn't want to leave that out. And it's, it's hard, because you don't want to feel like you're you know, talking about your, your parents or something, but, but that was the situation. And um, the nuns. <laughs> mm-hmm. They... I thought of them as communists (laughs) because, you know, they lived communally. They didn't accumulate or acquire. They wore the same thing every day. Uh, they, They actually used language that sounded like, don't we all kind of own everything? Don't we share? Uh, For example, one day, I think it was Sister Honoring, dropped her pen and said, Oh, Johnny, would you pick our pen up for me? Our pen. Mm -hmm. This really impressed me very deeply. I became someone who, if everyone didn't have something to eat, I didn't want anything to eat. It just seemed like a natural way of thinking because that's how they were. So, I, I guess, does that sound mm. kind of wacko, or does it sound like maybe it, it, doesn't sound it wacko could affect me. someone that way? Oh, sure. Mm-hmm. And uh, I wrote some notes, so yes. I'm 81, mm-hmm. going on 82, so you have to excuse my notes. Um, oh, yeah. Going back to the... the household, the family situation. As I said, they were really wonderful people, but they didn't get along too well with each other. Um, There was manipulation and propaganda. Not really huge and heavy, but it was sort of a stream of consciousness throughout where one of them was kind of supposed to be the hero and one was kind of supposed to be the the bad guy or the wrong one. And I started seeing through that. I was kind of a poet kid. You know, I think I'm probably pretty, I think all children are sensitive and far more aware than we know. But I just, um, I became very, very good at sensing any kind of propaganda and manipulation and freed, wanted to free myself of ever being that way Mm. in my life with 
uh, groups or people, individuals. And uh, then when I was teaching high school English, I focused a lot on teaching the kids to read into advertisements and to recognize propaganda. So I was kind of, I guess, becoming a socialist-minded person. What year was this? That was, oh, when I taught high school was uh, 59. That was way back. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really stay with that very long. I thought, these kids need th therapy. <laughs> because in order to, you know, not be either manipulated or a manipulator, it's kind of necessary to not lie to yourself, too. Mm -hmm. And so I, I went on and became a counselor. Mm -hmm. And so 1959, that was when the Civil Rights Movement was starting to bud, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Dr. King graduated seminary in maybe 55? And Probably. So do you remember, what's your earliest memory of the Civil Rights Movement? Um, boy, I wish I don't have an answer that pops right out. It was in the air. I, it was just always in the air. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what my exact earliest memory might be. But I did follow Dr. King and... Uh, I wrote a poem, Pour It Out, <laughs> just a devastating, devastated poem the day he was killed. I know I have it somewhere, I'm not sure where that is. Uh, but once again, it was the, I, of course, the necessity of justice. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be free as a person. I didn't want to be afraid of anyone or anything. And I wanted to learn that kind of strength. And I was tuned into Dr. King talking about love a lot. And that's eventually slowly got deeper and deeper. And now it is my main belief, my main operative principle mm -hmm. is love. And I brought this book just in case I talked about Dr. King and love today. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's... It's a book you don't hear about as much as, you know, some of his speeches and sermons. Mm, strength to love. Strength to love. Mm -hmm. And I really love this book. I guess I can put this down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know how this works. Because, you know, love is a wounded word. It's just commodified. It's overused, you know, it could be almost said to be almost meaningless. It's on Hallmark cards. <laughs> um, but really, love takes strength to practice. Mm. You get in trouble when you love. I mean, love the enemy. Mm. People think, well, that's weak, we've got to fight. And, uh, Dr. King talked about the, the strength to love. And he didn't invent the terms, the term, the two hands of love and nonviolence. I brought that with me too because it's so key to understand that love is the supreme power. And it does take strength and guts to practice it because it is misunderstood and it fights you can fight with love you know you hear people say about nonviolence um, no it's just a tactic this is a forever argument <laughs> um, that it's we want it to be just a tactic what do you mean we don't need to yes some of the people heroes of it if they have been clerics or religious, but that's, that's fine for them, but it's not necessary. It's only a tactic. And the thing is that I, I think something that is sometimes not understood is that 
what I just said a minute ago, love can fight. Mm -hmm. And also, they say you don't have to be a saint. Well, there may be a misunderstanding about what a saint is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, look at St. Augustine and tons of saints who were, saints are sinners. <laughs> They're the biggest sinners. And through their sin, which I understand comes from the origin of the word, comes from the word meaning missing the target, just missing the mark. So it's just kind of not, not aiming your life and your, your practice uh, very well until you practice it more. Mm -hmm. So, uh, no, of course you don't have to be a saint to practice nonviolence. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you, if you are, like some people, I think Martin Luther King is a saint, that doesn't mean anything except how much stronger you are and what a total human being who has made many mistakes. And we don't have to talk about his mistakes, but he made them. And, uh, oh, for heaven's sake, just be human, fully human, fully embodied in direct action. Uh, tell the truth about your quote unquote sins, that all the missing of the mark, the missing the target, and that's good. It's more and more human, mm -hmm. not some idealized, you know, version of it. Can you show us the hands you mentioned? Oh yes, those. thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marie. I, uh, these are my granddaughter's hands. She, she helped me to make this. Mm -hmm. Because I, I do give, wait a minute, excuse me, I want to, oh, okay. <laughs> I want to, uh, I wanted to have this to show when I give talks about nonviolent direct action. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought this turned out just really beautifully. I believe the originator was a, unheard of by so many people, incredible activist during the civil rights years in the South. She was an ally um, to the black civil rights movement. And she knew what it was like in many ways because she was a gay activist to be marginalized and you know, maybe stigmatized or uh, hated, I guess. Hopefully that's going away. Um, but to get back to the hands, so it's, I will work with you. You are not my enemy. I see you. I even see myself in you. I'm not better than you. There are alternatives. There are ways open to us. Uh, this is what needs to happen. All of that, that reaching out. And then this is stop. I will not cooperate. This is what you're doing is wrong. Um, let me see what I wrote on the back. I will resist it with every fiber of my being. So, Actually, I love you. We belong to each other. We are each other. Modern day physics tells us that. Uh, we're all made of the same stardust. We're all made of the cosmos. It's, it's not just poetry anymore, it's modern physics. And so we do belong to each other. But I will do everything in my power to stop you from doing this if you don't want to get on board with change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's the two hands of nonviolence. Mm -hmm. And did I give her name, Barbara Deming? Barbara Deming. I think okay. I just talked about her, but mm -hmm. I didn't give her name. Yep. Barbara Deming, okay. Wonderful, so I know Martin Luther King Jr. is a hero of yours. Who are some other heroes that you'd like to share something about? And I thought about that and uh, there are 
probably hundreds of them, Marie, mm -hmm. you know, so many. Of course, Daniel Berrigan is a hero of mine. He was my main guide and teacher when he came to Ithaca. And, you know, maybe I could say a little more about that later or at some point. And of course, Martin Luther King is a hero of mine. Of course, Gandhi is a hero of mine. Dorothy Day of the Catholic Worker Movement, who was, again, a woman. Oh, gosh, <laughs> the women don't seem to get, get uh, talked about quite as much. But she was a major power in the peace movement, Dorothy Day. And justice, of course, feeding the hungry. Mm -hmm. They go together. Uh, there, there can be no peace without justice. Mm -hmm. So, um, Helen Caldecott. Mm -hmm. And then maybe after I read these, there, there really aren't that many um, that I jotted down. I can either pick a couple to talk about in more detail, or may, if there's one that you think people might be interested in, you, you could ask me to say more about it, mm -hmm. however that goes. So I have Helen Caldecott, uh, Helen Keller, the two Helens, and then we're jumping to a philosopher and writer, Camus, the French writer, and now I wrote down peace vets. All, all peace vets. And then I have a, a couple I, I wrote down here. Uh, Brian Wilson and Doug Rocky. I guess they're the only two that I scribbled down there. Corbin Harney. Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. Now who's that? <laughs> and did I say Joe Pemberton, my late mm -hmm. lawyer? Okay. Um, yes, he's certainly a hero of mine. Um, I said Catherine. I think I'm just about done with the list. Oh, Einstein. And a woman named Abby Disney. And then I have Harriet Tubman, um, Muhammad Ali, and a recent hero, Reverend Barber, He's very, he's really taking Martin Luther King's, maybe I shouldn't say that place, but he's providing tremendous leadership for the poor people's movement and many things. And then I have some recent women who are doing all of it right now. Kathy Kelly, uh, you and I met her. Mm -hmm. Medea Benjamin, we met her. Anne Wright, we met her. Um, and, you know, those, those are some women who are just phenomenal peace and justice activists. I so. do. That's a great list, and I do have a few people that kind of pop out okay. to me. Well, and the first is because I love the story. It's oh. Muhammad Ali. Oh. <laughs> so maybe just briefly Gosh. tell us about your encounter Darn with you, him. Darn you, Marie. <laughs> it's just my favorite. And then um, um, maybe Helen Caldecott and Brian Wilson. But maybe just... Just one or two. Okay. Uh, so Helen was the first one, right? Or oh. how about Muhammad? Oh, Ali? Muhammad. Um, okay. <laughs> well, I did meet him, and it, it is, I guess, it's kind of, kind of a good story. Uh, but first, I'd like to say he's, he is a hero of mine. And I, I actually don't, I really, really use the word hero, but I, I kind of went with it. But it's, these are guides and teachers and role models and saints. Um, but, you know, of course, he refused to go to Vietnam. And he, I, gosh, I'm not really good with facts and numbers. I'm almost sure this is correct or close, but I think it was five years that he was prevented from his profession, from the only life that he, you know, that was him. I, I believe he couldn't fight for five years because of that. And uh, I wish I could quote him and remember exactly, but you know, it was something like, I ain't going to some far off country and kill the poor people there when my own people aren't free. I, it wasn't exactly that, so don't hold me to it, but it was something like mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. 
and um, and then, all right, I was in a parking lot in San Diego with my <laughs> son, Tony. We were looking for a sale at a sporting goods store. Huge parking lot, trying to find our way. And Tony, who was about 12, he said, Ma, there's a Muhammad Ali. I said, oh, I don't think so, Tony. <laughs> um, and he said, no, Ma, it's Muhammad Ali. Well, what do you mean? And so we went around a car and he pointed, we got a little closer. I couldn't believe it. He was sitting there alone at a table in front of the sporting goods store we were looking for. And it was a promotional, promotional thing. Um, maybe it was a brand new grand opening store. And I guess his guards or his assistants or whoever hadn't arrived yet, he was just sitting there at a table. He was kind of looking at his, the, I don't know what. And um, so we walked over there and, and just talked to him. My son was, could hardly talk, you know. <laughs> he was just in such amazement and awe, and I was. And then he cracked a joke and he asked me if I, should I tell this? It's a, All right, he I, asked me if I was married and I said, yeah, what's his name? And I told him, and he took out a piece of paper, and I do have it in a frame. <laughs> Couldn't resist. And I, I can't remember those exact words either, Marie and everybody, but it was, tell me I'm going to come and steal you away because you can do better. <laughs> I love that. That's so great. And guess what? I did do better <laughs> later. <laughs> <laughs> but not with Ali. Um, I don't know. He was a real kidder. He had an incredible sense of humor. Before he did that, there were lots of, he was just very, very funny and witty. And he, he was kind of a kid who, you know, he never lost the, the child in himself. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Oh, that's my Muhammad Ali story. Thank you. Maybe Helen and, called the call. Just briefly, okay. tell people who she is. But then I want to move on because I want to talk a little bit about um, the trial in 2004 that you were involved in Yeah, those in are the things Bellingham. that are going to really strap my poor little memory. But, um, okay, Helen, I met her too. Gosh. You know, I have never tried to meet someone because they were you know, special or famous. I, I, that's just never been something that's, I cared to, I wasn't interested particularly. And yet somehow I've met so many amazing people in the oddest ways. <clears throat> but I can't tell you what she said. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, but, okay, the story is her first book, I believe, nuclear madness. She was a pediatrician in Australia. She became a specialist in radiation and nuclear weapons. And she wrote this book, Nuclear Ma uh, Madness. And I found it and read it. And it, it was a ch change agent. I mean, it, it pierced me. I just ended up, I was the only one home kids were in school, crying on my little girl's bed. Just read the whole book and sobbed and cried on my little girl's bed. So Helen had a major impact on me. Actually, let me quickly say, she actually had a meeting with Ronald Reagan. And people say, people think, that who know about it, that she did influence him, you know, because he did get better about that. Um, but Nixon didn't. Now we're going through that again. <laughs> uh, don't go off on sidetracks, Ellen. Um, and then the last one was, oh, I really wanted to mention Catherine Hayhoe. Can I quickly? Mm -hmm. Please, yeah. Because no, I mean, hardly anyone's heard of her. <laughs> Dr. Catherine Hayhoe is an evan evangelical Christian professor at a university in Texas. 
uh, very much an eva evangelical Christian. Well, she teaches, she's a climate scientist, and she became a passionate speaker on the truth about what's happening to our earth and climate change. And uh, she received, she started to receive endless hate mail. Mm -hmm. And so they were from, sadly to say, a lot uh, from a sort of evangelical uh, Christian place. I'm not saying, you know, it's probably a very small group, but they did not want her. They hated her. They threatened her child. I saw an interview with her. And uh, she wanted humans to wake up and take action and do something. And she just, she was as evangelical mm -hmm. because she really did love truth um, and the God that she worshiped. And uh, she didn't stop. She can, has continued on, to the best of my knowledge. I consider her a kind of a whistleblower. And I want to quickly say Kim Fook, because she is the little girl, the famous, famous picture that helped end the Vietnam War, running naked down the road with some other children from Napalm. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they had all been sheltering in a temple. I believe it was a, a Buddhist building of some kind maybe a temple, and uh, she, I also met her <laughs> on the phone. I wrote a poem about her, and because it has such sacred material, I, I never read a poem about sacred material about another person without their permission. So I researched, and before, the, before I had a computer anyway, but I finally found her, an article about her, and contacted her, and I had to leave a message. And I, I said I was mailing her the poem, and could she possibly in some way let me know if it's OK to ever read it? And she called me, and I saved the message. I still have it. She thanked me very much. She said, yes, you can read the poem anytime. And she has started a, well, a long time now. She, she uh, founded a program to help children of war. And she lives in Canada. Mm. Those are beautiful stories of your interactions right. with these I better amazing stop change now. makers. Sure, we could have the whole interview about that. Um, so you had a trial here mm -hmm. in 2004 in Bellingham. And it got national recognition. Mm -hmm. And it was about depleted uranium. And some people may not know what that is. So maybe you could talk about that briefly. Okay. Oh, I guess I didn't bring that. I found a, I did find an article that was in a nationwide oh. publication. I guess I didn't bring it. Um, first, the first thing I have to say, if I'm going to talk about that, is Margie White, RN. <laughs> she made almost all the signs and banners, and uh, I believe she uh, is in a retirement home in Spokane now, so I'm not in touch with her. but. She is the one who alerted me, really, to depleted uranium. She was a retired nurse and got me to looking into it. And it was and is still used. Jim Albertini of the Peace Center in Hawaii says they're using it there in the firing range. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, I won't try to go into the science of it, but it's an element, if that's the right word, of uranium which when it's like put at the tip of artillery, for example, um, it penetrates, it can penetrate tanks. And so it was very much loved by the Pentagon and it was used. And uh, some of many of our own soldiers have been ill from its results. And uh, and they have called me when they saw that article. And uh, so what it does, it, there's a book about it, it aerosolizes. So it's actually a ceramic, 
uh, system, ceramicized system, when it's when it leaves the the thing that shoots it, <laughs> and so a lot of people. Well, look, this is really hard to talk about. I'm sorry. Um, a lot of tanks were. Were, were contaminated, of course, because it was special for tanks. It's used for other things too, and so civilians would come. Even children, you know, ch they'd play in these tanks. And also, it before it aerosolizes, it turns into a dust, or maybe that's after it penetrates. I'm sorry, I don't remember all these scientific details, but it is all over Iraq, or in many places, and it's in the ground. Mm -hmm. And the cancer rates are very high there. And so let's remember war never ends. It goes on and on and on. Through families, through people's DNA, through dust, through dirt, through the air, through generational trauma. Uh, couldn't resist saying that. Uh, anyway, I. All I wanted to do really was hand out warning information to the recruits, potential recruits, at the recruiting center that we have here, which has a new name now. Um, I must say, I, I, don't, I don't hate the military. I try not to hate anything or anyone. I certainly don't, not at all. But they do seem to change the name of things when people, <laughs> when it starts going the wrong way, propaganda-wise. So, I think that's called the Career Center now. And I just wanted to be able to hand these things out. And I did talk to, to the recruiters. We had great conversations. I remember particularly with the, the Army recruiter. And uh, nobody tried to stop me. But when I tried to leave the building, the aforesaid Margie White <laughs> was outside the building and she wouldn't let me out. And it, she wasn't trying to keep me in. She just, she was trying to do an action of blocking the door for a while. Mm -hmm. She probably didn't even know it was me. But I had decided, well, I'm out of leaflets and I've done the work I came here to do. And, and so I realized Margie was up against the door doing kind of a different part of this action. Mm -hmm. And so I just sat on the floor and waited. And uh, when I finally did come out, the police had been called, and Margie was and another person were being hauled away, and they hauled me away too. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, I guess the leaflets weren't enough. When you do things out of love, you 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 know you do get guidance and you're kind of shown what to do next. So I did end up with a three-day trial by jury, and uh, the blessed presente, Joe Pemberton, was my defense, and there were a couple other local attorneys who helped, um, not in the courtroom. And, you know, I was convicted as a result of one juror who voted for conviction, and he was an Iraq war vet. And he was interviewed later, and he said, I think she did the right thing, but it was against the law. Mm -hmm. So actually, I didn't do anything against the law, but he thought I did, I guess, because uh, I was sort of tied in with the other action. But it was all all to the good, I realized I needed to do much more than, than the leaflets. And so then, speaking of veterans, Dr. Doug Rocky, major Dr. Doug Rocky, health physicist, was asked by the Army, or ordered, I guess, you know, he was given the job of going back to Iraq and cleaning up the, what was left from the depleted uranium. Mm. And so he brought our tanks back to the Nevada test site area, and then they, actually he didn't know that much about depleted uranium, it was kind of, but of course he, he was a scientist and he, 
knew what he was doing. Uh, he got into it. And he, I believe, contacted my attorney and or someone, they got in touch and he wanted to come here to testify for me. Mm. So he came all the way and he was ill himself. By the way, his whole team was ill. Mm. The really fine details of this hideous depleted uranium, this substance uh, is still probably not really known and it certainly isn't advertised. But he came here from Iowa on his own dime and uh, the judge would not allow him to testify in front of the jury. But she was, not all judges would even do this, she did allow him to testify in court on the record. Mm -hmm. And so he did. Mm -hmm. And he, he said he wanted to nominate me for a military <laughs> medal or something, I don't remember his exact words, but best of my knowledge that hasn't happened. Um, but he, he just, he knew whereof he spoke deeply. And, uh, but I was convicted and was there anything else about the trial that? No, that's great. So that was 2004. And then you oh. and I met in 2005 yeah. because you were an organizer and co-founder of the Peace and Justice Center. It was well, a kind group. Of. I helped, of, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's a lot of people. Yeah. Okay. Mainly and Jamie. Jamie Donaldson. And then you and I, in 2006, we got together a committee of the troops home to pass that resolution, work with Terry Borneman and the city council. So that was also working with veterans, but I know your work goes way back because we had some veterans on that committee. We had a gold star mother, mm -hmm. a blue star father. We did, mm -hmm. yes. Blessed Doris Kent. Mm -hmm. And so that passed 6-1. And Jean, whose kid was over there. Jean yeah. Marks, yeah. So that passed 6-1. to one. It did. And then that was the first, we were the first city in the state to pass any kind of resolution like yes. that. Yes. So it was kind of a regional and news. The other thing I guess I didn't bring that I had ready to bring was the resolution itself. Okay. I found it, and, but that's okay. It, it, we called it the Troops Home Resolution. Troops Home Resolution. And it was amazing that it passed six to one. Mm -hmm. And do you want to talk a little bit about how we did that? Because it's strategy? Sure, if you want. Mm -hmm. um, it has to do with a nonviolent strategy or, um, yeah, go ahead. Social justice, activism in general. Well, what we did was, do you remember we, because I had to try to think back. I either chose or was given Joan Beardsley Presente as the city council member I would work with. So we each got, or maybe two people had one, mm -hmm. a city council member to work with. And this really turned out to be an excellent strategy, you folks who are planning strategies. Um, because, you know, I remember she and I went to the old Stewarts and had coffee and got to know each other and she really was receptive because that's how we did it. And that's what I heard from everyone else mm -hmm. that met with, do you remember who you met with? Jean Knutson. Oh, okay. Right, who I still love to this day, <laughs> but yeah, Jean Marks and I were on. Uh, right. Yeah. And uh, so they really understood our mission. They had an opportunity to ask us questions, to challenge us, to, to sort of play the devil's advocate and why this wouldn't be a good idea for a city council. Mm. And so we went through that whole process and I think that largely contributed to the six voting mm -hmm. for the troops mm -hmm. home. And do you remember when we came out that night of city council, uh, Robert Blake and Jan Peters were playing Imagine mm -hmm. in the hallway and that's marble so it was echoing. Mm -hmm. And Jan's my son. Uh, and Robert's my sort of, sort of like a son sometimes. And that was wonderful to come out and hear Imagine. And every, we all joined in and sang mm -hmm. Imagine. It was beautiful. Yeah. It was beautiful. So some people might say, 
oh, great, did it end the war? I mean, there is cynicism out there, and why not? I mean, we're at several dire, dire tipping points on this earth and in this, this human situation. And I understand cynicism, but every action counts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. That is a good segue into talking about hope. And I want to know, because you're a sensitive person, you can experience things that seem bleak and I'm wondering what gives you hope. Oh my gosh. You know, I was early this morning because yeah, I go by the buses. They, they don't run right when you want them to. <laughs> and so I had time, so I went to the library. Actually, actually, to be utterly forthright, I couldn't remember Joan's last name. And I wanted to look her up, Joan mm -hmm. Beardsley, as the city council member I met with. And, and, you know, I just kind of hung out with emails for a while until I thought it was time to walk up here. And, you know, the library is, it's a homeless center in some ways. There are people who is the only place they can sleep and they can kind of get away with having a book in front of them maybe and get a few nods. And the librarians are so wonderful. And uh, as I was entering the library, and I've had many experiences there with people, but there was a woman with a card and uh, and she was crying. Mm. That's bleak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's pretty darn bleak. Um, it's not like finding out that another giant, you know, iceberg section has fallen into the sea. <clears throat> that kind of bleak. Or endless war, what Andrew Basevich calls, or he, I don't know if he invented the term, but he repeated the term infinite war. You know, Martin Luther King said, hope is infinite, as you know. Mm -hmm. So now what the humans have come up with is infinite war. But uh, I, I, I stopped. And again, when you're, and I do, I'm, I, try, I try not to say things like this, because it sounds woo-woo, and I'm not woo-woo. But I feel guided by love. Mm -hmm. I've given myself to love, and it comes through for me. She comes through for me. Anyway, I, I don't always stop. I don't always, everything isn't my job. Um, I was a chemical dependency counselor. I know about codependence. But I felt called to stop. And what, the thing that was going to help me to not have this hoarseness and to have to drink water was that I brought an ice cold ginger ale with me. And uh, I also f was feeling a little stomach nervous doing an interview. And, you know, that's what she wanted and needed. Because, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, I, I just, I didn't try to engage her in conversation. I just, you know, held her arm and, and stood there with her a little while. And then uh, I said, I'm going to go in the library now. Are you going to be OK? And she said, yeah. And I said, gee, you know, all I have, I've got a ginger ale. And she said, that's what I need. That'll help my upset stomach. Is it cold? <laughs> it was. So I gave her my ginger ale. <laughs> and um, that, that's, that should be, that is everyday life. That's just everyday life. Nonviolence and direct action. It's a way of life. Let it be. It's okay. Let it be a w your way of life. Uh, where was I? Answering. About hope. Hope. And oh. I wanted to interject a similar story. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one night when it was really cold in December, Terry Borneman did a Facebook post and he says, I was walking along the sidewalk with one of my dear friends and there was a man who was very cold, huddled without a hat. And the person that I was walking with knelt down, took her hat off, and offered it to him. 
And so I wrote back at the comment, was that Ellen Murphy? <laughs> <laughs> and he wrote back, yes, it was. We all, we all have the gifts from nonviolence and love and hope. And we just, you know, I've just kind of gotten used to answering them. And so have millions of people all over the world. And, you know, if, if some of us haven't let ourselves go into that life yet, well, go ahead. Let's go. Um, yeah. That, and that hat was given, to, it was warm. It was a nice wool hat. <laughs> it was given to me by Sharon Crozier, whose uh, campaign I helped with when she ran for mayor. And she's presente, passed on. So, but, you know, it's good to have that, um, the inner knowledge that comes with hope. And, and hope, I don't believe, is, is a thing. I do believe it is infinite. I mean, it's, it's a thing, but it isn't. I used to say to my, you know, addict client in the hospital, my, my addicts, um, there's two kinds of hope. There's, there used to be a cartoon, and the cartoon character would say, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope. Well, that's not hope. That's wishful thinking, that's, oh, could something good just happen to me? Um, but hope is a portal to, to the infinite, as Martin Luther King says. Um, it, it's something that you just walk with all the time. And yeah, of course there are bad days, you know. Oh my gosh, uh, the news. <laughs> But in bad moments, awful, we're human. We've got to stay human and let ourselves feel. It's just that hope is there waiting. And one thing I've learned from you, and I know that you've passed along this wisdom to others, is the hope that when you're doing something, when you're opening up and when you're resisting, that there's hope in that. Because just being still paralyzed, stagnant, isn't going to get us anywhere, but it's uplifting for the soul to be in movement. Oh, nice, Thank you. Marie. Thank you, yeah. And to close, I think you have a beautiful quote that you brought, if you want to share that. I did. Yeah. Oh, darn it. Corbin Harney was one of my other heroes from the Nevada nuclear test site. Mm. Western Shoshone. Um, I brought this. Just as I was going out the door, I said, well, I have to bring Aaron Dottie Roy. And if this isn't a statement about hope, infinite hope, I don't know what is. I want to say it right. Remember this. You know, she's in India Indian uh, writer. The God of Small Things was her famous book. Remember this. We are many and they are few. They need us more than we need them. Another world is possible. She is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her. Breathing. So, that's, that's what hope is. Hear her breathing. The Divine Mother, <laughs> Unchi Maka. Thank you so much for your time, Thank Ellen you, Marie. Murphy. It's been really nice talking with you. It's been very nice talking mm -hmm. with you. Okay. And thank you for joining us on Ellingham Voices. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.